All right, welcome back, fellow scientists. So can you believe it? It is actually the end of the year. Uh, this is our very last uh, notes that we're going to do. Uh, usually, if we, if this was the end of a regular year, uh, we would, you know, have a review day and then have a test over evolution. And then we'd have like a week of review for the final, and then we'd, we'd have our final over semester two. But as you all know, this is not an ordinary year, unfortunately. Uh, so we're going to run through notes. I apologize. This is going to be like super fast, but the video is going to be really long. I know that going into it. I apologize. I'm sorry. Bear with me. Um, this like this is really important stuff. This is really, really, really interesting stuff. Um, I think so, at least. <laughs> and uh, and so then we'll have a quiz, a Microsoft Forms quiz uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday, whenever you have class. And of course, that'll be timed. Uh, I'll try to make it so you can get it done in half an hour, but I'll give you an hour to do it. So there shouldn't be any anyone who goes over time. Please make sure to submit it like before your computer says one o'clock, if it's due at one o'clock, because after your computer says one o'clock, guess what? It's after one o'clock, right? One uh, one o'clock and 10 seconds is after one o'clock. And that's kind of how your computer counts it. So even if you look down at your computer time and it says one o'clock and you press submit, that's late, right? Because it's after one o'clock, like one o'clock, that's the deadline. So really, if, it, if the deadline's like one, you should submit it like 1255 or something like that. Uh, that's what that's what they did with AP tests when they administered all the AP tests online. Like they said, okay, when you have five minutes left, you need to start submitting just to make sure, just to make sure you have time. Um, so anyways, apologize for not bringing that to your attention before, but a couple of people were, were kind of stuck that way. They're like, I submitted it exactly at one and said it, well, yeah, because it is over time. If you're doing something you want, it's over time. Uh, but anyways, uh, I digress. So Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, really short time quiz. And then that's it. Uh, then I'll see you guys on Thursday for textbook turn-in day of the high school. Or if you guys have younger siblings uh, and you don't think that you need your textbook for the test on Tuesday or Wednesday, you could turn in all of your high school materials uh, either at the elementary um, day, which is going to be on Monday, I think, or at the middle school day, which is either on Tuesday or Wednesday. I'm not sure. I can't. I can't remember. All right. I've eaten up like five minutes. I apologize. We'll just get right into it. Take notes as best you can. There's going to be a summary slide at the very, very end uh, where we yeah, talk about evidence for evolution, uh, kind of summarize evidence for evolution. So a lot of you think, oh, well, okay, evolution, whatever, but there's no evidence for it. Uh, remember, at the, the very beginning, the very first video, I said, I don't want you to go into your college classes and think that you have like a machine gun, right? Uh, and you're going to argue against your college professor and you're going to prove him wrong or her wrong. Uh, and 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 they're gonna they're gonna convert to Christianity uh, and and they're gonna renounce their evolutionary ways right and it's great I don't want you to go in uh, to, to that classroom with that mindset but then only find out that you have that you have a pea shooter right because it's not about the evidence right it's not about the evidence it's about it's about the worldview okay do you believe that there is a God or do you believe that there's not a God do you believe that we're just a random assemblage of chemicals and life has no meaning? Or do you believe that we are made in the image and likeness of God and that our meaning is to honor and glorify God, right? That's, that is what, that's, that's the crux of the issue right there. It's not about the evidence, right? In fact, if it was about the evidence, they would win because most of the evidence is on their side because guess how they form their opinions, right? Based on the evidence. We have a preconceived notion because we read the Bible. And so we have the, um, have the worldview or the mindset of authority, Right? They have the worldview or mindset of empiricism. The evidence is so strong, actually, that some people change the way, change their interpretation of the Bible based on, based on the evidence. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, here we go. So we've already seen this, right? And then we've kind of zoomed out uh, to, to this slide right here. And so all of this PowerPoint is going to kind of be going through, like, what evidence do scientists use to make this tree of life? Because science is always based on evidence. Right. You always got to have your observations. And then from those observations, you have to make inferences. Right. Now, we know that scientists don't include the supernatural uh, in their inferences. Uh, and so they won't come to the same conclusions that we do because we do believe in the supernatural. Uh, so here we go. First big category is geologic. Right. Or Earth. Uh, and so first category within geologic is fossils. So we actually see change in the fossil record. So here is a chambered nautilus kind of like in the fossil record and kind of what it looks like today. Right. And then before the chambered nautilus looks like this, much the same, except for less sections. 
Uh, before that, we also have a fossil, the chambered nautilus, potentially looked like this, right? Uh, so it was just like the same thing, but it was just long and drawn out instead of instead of spirally, right? And then before then, the chambered nautilus, right, looked like this. Now, are those different species? Are those the same species? Well, we don't know because they're fossils, so we can't tell if they could if they could breed or not. But we definitely see change in in the fossil record. Uh, so that's one way that they make the tree of life. Uh, relative dating is a is a second thing kind of related to fossils. So uh, that's talking about like the layers of the earth, right? And before this layer right here uh, was put in place, right? This layer had to be there. And before this layer was put in place, this layer had to be there and so on and so forth. And so as we dig down deeper into the earth, essentially we're going backwards in time right now. As we do that, evolution says that we started out as single-celled organisms and we go from simple to complex. And as we do that, as we dig down into the earth, we actually see that. We see that 650 million years ago, right, life was fairly simple. Uh, and then as we as we rise up towards the surface in our in our geological survey, uh, life gets more complex. Another way to date fossils, radioisotope dating. So this is carbon dating, this is carbon-14. Radioactive elements decay at a certain rate and they give off energy. Uh, and then they also change into different things. Uh, so I thought of a I thought of a good analogy for this, right? So it's coming into summer. You guys love like water balloon fights, and my boys love water balloon fights. We just had one two days ago and it was really hot. Um, and so so we know we start with a certain amount of water balloons, right? Uh, and then they throw the water balloons. Right. And then the water balloons turn into little small water balloon pieces that are really hard to pick out of the front lawn. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Amen. Uh, so so I can tell right not only by my children's screams, uh, but I can tell how long the water balloon fight has been going on by looking at the number of water balloons left in the container and looking at the number of fragments of water balloon pieces on the ground. So the number of water balloons is kind of like the radioactive isotopes. They're going to they're going to get off. They're going to. Uh, give off energy, uh, they're going to change it to something else. And then the accumulating daughter atoms, they are the, the water balloon pieces. So radioisotope dating, I know that it gets a, a bad rep uh, in Christian circles, but it's actually legitimate. It's actually uh, fairly, you know, fairly, fairly logical and fairly consistent. Now, I know that you guys have probably heard, well, it's, you know, like there's this piece of rope that we know was new and, and they dated it to like thousands of years ago. Well, you know what? That's okay. That's within their margin of error, because guess what? If the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, then being off by a couple thousand years doesn't really matter. Them, right? It's like, it's like it doesn't really matter. OK, now, if the Earth is 6000 years old, then a thousand years like that's that's one sixth of the whole entire Earth. So that really, really matters. So being off by a thousand or even a million years, right, isn't really that bad. And, the, and these these um, methods of dating are much more precise than, than a million years. So suffice it to say, radioisotope dating is logical and it works and it's it's scientifically valid. Uh, plate tectonics, you guys know all about this. There's vast evidence uh, for plate tectonics that the, Earth, the Earth's crust is made of plates and all the continents are riding around on plates. Uh, and that we used to we used to have, right, like a Pangea, right, type, uh, type situation. Oops, hang on, go back. We used to have like a Pangea type situation and now the continents are far apart. And if we know the rate that they move, which we do, it's a couple centimeters per year, then how long did it take uh, South America to get separated from Africa and North America to get, well, longer longer than a biblical timeline, longer than six to 10,000 years, right? Uh, canyon carving, mountain building, how long did it take to form the Grand Canyon? Uh, probably not made by Noah's flood, right? Probably made by the great Missoula ice dam that kind of kind of came through, crashing through, or possibly created over millions of years by the Colorado River, just steady, steady kind of erosion, right? Uh, the Himalayas, tallest mountain range in the world, is being created by the subcontinent of India crashing into Asia and then and then pushing up the mountains. Mount Everest grows, oh, I want to say like a couple centimeters per year, right? And so the newest people to climb Mount Everest are, are climbing the highest mountain range uh, yeah, ever, right? Because it, it keeps on growing. So here's a summary. Earth is really old. Species have evolved uh, or species have changed over time uh, or evolved. Now, there are a couple counterpoints, right, like scientifically valid counterpoints, but nowhere near the amount of evidence uh, that that uh, the kind of the mainstream science has. So Mount St. Helens, classic poster child uh, for fast geologic change. Right. So we get this big old bulge right here that grows at a rate of up to five feet per day. So mountains can grow very quickly. Right. And then and then someone pops the pimple. 
right? It erupts uh, and all sorts of stuff happen and the mud flows and fills in the valleys and stops up rivers, but then the rivers have to have some way to get through. And so they come crashing through the newly placed sediment and debris and deposits. And then scientists go in and they kind of evaluate and they kind of measure and stuff like that. And I heard a quote from one scientist. It's like, it's like a thousand years of, of erosion uh, and, and canyon mountain building and canyon carving took place in like eight minutes. Right. And so some geologic changes happen fairly quickly. I look at this picture and it, it harkens me back to this picture, which is the Grand Canyon. Right. We have a canyon and then we have a small little river. Right. And blah, 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 blah. blah. So what we would need for that is we would need a active volcano uh, fairly close to to the Grand Canyon. Uh, and so Yellowstone National Park sits on uh, what used to be a super volcano. Uh, and we, we can dig down into the earth and we can find ash from previous volcanic eruptions. Right. Uh, and so we can find ash from this old Yellowstone supervolcano uh, that could possibly have erupted and then and then kind of changed. Um, here it is, Arizona. Right. Then kind of changed. Um, what do you call it? Something all the way, all the way down here. Right. Uh, so that's one thing. And then another thing is fossils. Right. So this is a fossil of a fish eating another fish. This is a fossil of a fish giving birth. Right. So this kind of flies in the face of accepted. Like, how do you form a fossil? And fossils that like things have to die and then they have to be buried quickly and then like over millions of years have to be right. Well, this this uh, kind of indicates that no, we can we can have fossils that are formed very quickly, like and be snapshots of moments. Right. This is called a coelacanth. Uh, this disappeared from the fossil record 66 million years ago, and so scientists thought they were extinct until 1983. All of a sudden, a diver off the coast of Africa finds a fish that looks very similar to the fossil of the coelacanth. So the fossil record is not complete, right? Now, does that just totally demolish and destroy all the evolutionary scientists' arguments? No, they actually have an open mind. They're they're far more open-minded than, than most Christians are. They'll say, huh, that's interesting. Well, let's go investigate that, right? And so they do. Uh, and so, yeah, so I, I, have, I have respect for people who, who, will, who will have an open mind and who will investigate and will try to incorporate new facts into their existing worldview. Uh, this person right here is Dr. Mary Schweitzer. Uh, if you want to find, if, you, <laughs> if you're not tired of YouTube yet, uh, if you want to look up this 60 Minutes Presents uh, B-Rex, uh, it's fascinating. Uh, she actually dissolved fossils in acid, which you shouldn't do because then all the mineral stuff will go away. Uh, but she actually found soft tissue in the fossils, which shouldn't have survived after millions and millions of years. Uh, and so this indicates that maybe fossilization as a process, you know, we don't, we don't know everything about fossilization. Maybe, maybe we're wrong on some points. Maybe it doesn't take really, really long to make a fossil, right? So again, does that just fly in the face of, of everything, you know, evolution and old earth? No, it's like, well, that's interesting. Let's figure out why, All right? So, so I love that. I love that attitude uh, of science. Now, don't get me wrong, right? I, I know that the Bible is true. The Bible is my basis of truth. Uh, the true things are that Jesus is God. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And by believing in him, I can have eternal life uh, with God in heaven when he creates a new heaven and new earth. Like, like those, those are my rock solid. Those, those are my things. I know that God created the earth, right? What I hold with an open hand, I, I have some ideas about it, but I'm, I'm not going to fight against anyone who has different ideas. Open hand would be how God created the earth, right? Did he say poof and it was there? Or did he did he lovingly and caringly over millions of years fashion and form right this this earth uh, for uh, his image bearers right possibly right I, I know that God created right how he created right God created closed handed issue I'm holding on to that that's undeniable uh, open handed issue how God created right so here's summary of our counterpoint we have evidence that some geologic changes happen very quickly and also fossilization uh, is 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 different is a process that we don't know everything about. All right, first, first big point was geology. Second big point, anatomy and physiology, what they look like, okay, so simple to complex. Uh, we see this with nervous system and with brain, right? So uh, sea sponge, sea anemone, shows up very early, right, in the, in the fossil record, uh, and they just have a nerve net, they don't have a brain. Humans show up later in the fossil record, and they, they actually have a brain, and we see transitional forms, we see the worm, and then we see the squid, and, and different things like that, right? Uh, circulatory systems, right? So fish have a two-chambered heart uh, in a circulatory system. Amphibians, reptiles, they have a three-chambered heart, right? And then mammals and birds, we have a four-chambered heart, right? So again, we see this simple, simple to complex. Fish show up first, 
uh, and then amphibians and reptiles, uh, and then birds and mammals. And so we see two-chambered, three-chambered, four-chambered, uh, simple to complex. We actually we actually find that. There's actually good evidence for it. Homologous structures, bones that have the same structure but different function. Now, this, this is, this is going to be a mind bender, right? You might want to play this at like 0.5 speed just so that you can have time to think about it, right? Uh, so homologous structure, like picture... Picture uh, a building, right? Buildings are designed by architects, intelligent architects, right? Uh, and so these buildings, like if you walk into a house, you know it's a house because of its form. If you walk into an office building, you know it's an office building because of what it looks like and its layout and structure. If you walk into a factory or a warehouse, you know that it's a factory or a warehouse because, because of what it looks like inside. So, so people have taken that same logic and they've applied it to animals. And they say, okay, if I look at something and I look at the bone structure, like all the things with the same bone structure should use that limb for the same purposes, right? And so here's some swimming things. Penguin swim, seal swim, blue whale swims, and fish swim. So so scientists would look at these look at these limbs and say, if there's an intelligent designer, if this was the if if life was the product of some intelligent being, right, then we should see the same basic form for these fins. Well, when they investigate, they don't because here's the penguin, right? And here's the seal, okay? And here's the blue whale, uh, and then here's the fish, right? They all use them for swimming, but they don't they don't have the same form. Same thing with a bird and a goose and uh, or sorry, a bat and a, and a bird, a uh, goose. So they both fly. They should have the same form, right? They should have like an office building is an office building is an office building. The same basic form, the same basic structure, uh, in their wing, but we look uh, and they don't, right? The goose has this, you know, uh, humerus, radius, ulna, and then this kind of gobbledygook, right? And then the bat has humerus, radius, ulna, uh, and then it actually has fingers, right? And so we don't see the, the exact same structure. However, comma, if we look at the penguin, which is a bird, and we look at the goose, which is a bird, we see a more similar structure, even though this is used for swimming and this is used for flying, more similar structure. Now that doesn't make sense from an architectural point of view, right? They're like, okay, <laughs> and I don't mean to, I don't mean to to be sputting, and some of you might might react badly against this, but I'm not making fun of God. I'm I'm presenting uh, a different person's point of view. So this different person who doesn't believe in God, they're like, uh, if there is an intelligent designer, right? He's not very intelligent. Because this is not how humans would do it. They would have one form, and that one form would be the best way to move through the air or the water. This is more like a random process with random mutations and different environments. Uh, and then those random mutations that are good being selected for in different environments, and those random mutations that are bad being selected against in different environments, right? We also see this with mammals. The seal is a mammal, humans a mammal, cats a mammal, whale, whales a mammal, bats a mammal, right? Human uses its forearms for grasping. Cat uses its forearms for walking. Whale uses its forearms for swimming. And bat uses its forearms for flying. And yet here we see humerus, radius ulna, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges in all of these things. And so, so architects look at that and, and scientists look at that and that's not very wise. That's not very smart. You have basically the same form, the same, uh, the same basic anatomy, the same basic architecture used for vastly different things. That's not very smart. Why would an intelligent designer do that? There must not be an intelligent designer or if there is, he's not very intelligent. Again, taking pot shots at God, which I'm not doing. I'm presenting, I'm presenting their view, uh, if, that, if that makes sense to you. Spine flexing, right? There must be one uh, most efficient way to move through water. Sharks, their uh, spine moves side to side. Uh, killer whales, orcas, their spine moves up and down, right? Uh, on land, there must be one way to, to move across the land. Cheetah, their spine flexes up and down, right? Komodo dragon, their spine flexes back and forth, right? This doesn't make sense, right? Why, why is this? Well, evolutionary scientists would say, well, it's because the, the orca is descended from land-dwelling mammals. Uh, and these land-dwelling mammals, they have spines that flex up and down, right? Uh, and then the Komodo dragon is descended from, from the sharks, right? And so they have spines that move kind of kind of side to side. So these are more closely related, even though they're in different environments. These are more closely related, even though they're in different environments because of their anatomy and physiology, because it's up and down uh, or, it's, or it's side to side. Right, so homologous structures, spine flexing, uh, show relatedness and support the support the truth.
life. So basically, evolutionary scientists would be poking fun of God at this point. They'd say, why would a creator make different bone structures for limbs that perform the same functions, right? We really have no logical, uh, like scientific answer, but guess what? That's totally fine because we go to scripture because that's the ultimate truth by which we can judge all other truth claims, right? We would go to Romans 11, right? Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? We can't tell God what you did makes no sense because it doesn't make sense to us. That's putting ourselves above God. That's a place where we never want to be. We always want to be humble and we always we don't want to be prideful. We always want to be underneath God and underneath his wisdom. Romans 9, right? The second part of Romans 9, probably my favorite, like, chunk of scripture in the whole entire Bible. Basically, it says, uh, like, who are you, O clay, to talk back to the potter, right? Basically, it's know your role and shut your mouth because God is God and he does what he wants. Uh, Unfortunately, he loves us. If he didn't love us, then we would just be toast, like, forever ago, right? Uh, So counterpoint, evolutionary scientists say common ancestor, creationists say common designer, but again, that's getting at two different worldviews. You have to admit that there's a designer before you say common designer. Uh, Common ancestor, you don't have to have a designer, it just has to be random, which is kind of what it appears to be. Uh, Third thing, under anatomy and physiology, I know we're going fast, I apologize, I'm going to try to make this video shorter than a half an hour, right? Vestigial organs are structures a degenerate, imperfectly developed organ that has, uh, or structure that has little or no utility, right? So the flightless cormorant wings, why are they there? Well, they're leftovers from evolution. Why would a creator make something that's useless, right? Uh, Kiwi wing, same thing. Why would a creator make something that's useless? Snake spurs, why would a creator make something that's useless? Whales have hip bones. I bet you didn't know that, right? What does that mean? Well, evolutionary scientists would say that means that whales used to have legs, but they suffered mutations. And in their environment, the loss of their hind legs was not a bad thing. It was a good thing. Now, if they had been land dwelling mammals, then the loss of their legs would have been a bad thing. And that would have been selected against. But whales living in the living in the ocean uh, lost their hind legs. It made them more streamlined. It reduced drag. And so that was actually a good thing. Right. So whales have hip bones kind of encased in all that blubber. They don't do anything. They're just there. They're left over. They're vestigial structures. They're evidence for evolution. Right. Uh, We have we have a pretty good fossil record. Right. Of transitional forms of this mammal uh, to whale uh, transition. Right. All these are actual skeletons that they actually found. Uh, And I was curious. Right. So I looked up like an actual picture of an actual whale skeleton at, at some aquarium somewhere. And sure enough, there they are. Little hip bones just kind of sitting there in the blubber, just kind of like floating, like not attached to anything else, just kind of just kind of there, right? Uh, human tailbone, classically cited as uh, as a leftover from evolution, right? Because uh, our ancestors of us and monkeys, right, had tails, and so that's what's left. Uh, <laughs> it is actually a scientific fact that some humans are born with small, tiny, little rudimentary tails. Uh, no kidding. Manatees have toenails. Right, cute, cuddly looking like things that get chopped up by propellers in, in Florida. Right? They have toenails, they're they're swimming creatures, they have no use for toenails. They chuff along and they kinda they kind of scrape up uh, grass and stuff like that. Seaweed with their mouths, uh, on the on the they, they don't they don't dig, they don't have right. So why do they have toenails? Well, they're left over from evolution. By the way, manatees also have hip bones, indicating that their ancestors were once uh, walking on land. Right? The human appendix classically cited as a, as a vestigial organ. Um, so it's right where the small intestine meets the large intestine. If you look at other mammals like rabbits, they have a cecum, they have an enlarged pouch right where the small intestine meets the large intestine. It's where there, there's a lot of bacteria that helps them to digest the grass that they eat, right? Guess what's found in the appendix? A lot of good beneficial bacteria, right? So why is there a lot of good beneficial bacteria found in the appendix? Well, it's just kind of hanging out, left over, not really needed. You can have your appendix removed and still go on and live a totally healthy, normal life, right? So why would a creator, this is a summary of their arguments, right, of, of evolutionary arguments. Why would a creator make useless structures? It makes no sense. Useless structures must be leftovers from the process of evolution. Now, counterpoint from the Christian point of view. That statement is an argument from ignorance, which if you've taken logic, you know that that's a logical fallacy. Okay, just because we don't know the function of a certain organ doesn't mean that it have no function. Some people have, have thought, have posited, that whale hip bones might be used for mating. 
uh, as, as kind of like a bedrock or a foundation for their mating structures, right? Human appendix might be home for beneficial bacteria that keep us healthy. Snake spurs might help snakes climb trees. They would indicate that snakes used to have legs, which isn't really a problem because that's exactly what the Bible says anyways. Um, so we had, we had topic number one, geology. Topic number two, anatomy and physiology. Topic number three, and this is our last topic, molecular evidence. Okay, so first evidence is DNA. Sequence of DNA is different in different organisms for the same proteins. We know the central dogma. DNA makes RNA, makes proteins, which make you, right? So if, if, an, if an animal, like the protein for cellular respiration, everything does cellular respiration. Everything needs the exact same proteins for cellular respiration. So it would make sense from a design perspective that everyone would have the exact same DNA for that same protein. That's not actually what we see. Cytochrome C is one of the, is one of the um, proteins in cellular respiration. And here we have Homo sapiens. So that's us. Pan troglodytes, that's a chimpanzee. Os taurus, that's a cow, right? And we see these little red letters. Those are differences in the DNA for that protein. That doesn't make sense from a design perspective. If you're going to make the protein, and if you're going to make it as recently as 6,000 years ago, then you're going to look at the DNA and it's all going to be the same, right? So again, we go back to, to their argument. It, this is not an intelligent design. This is not the most efficient. This speaks to a random process, which evolution is, right? Now, I know some of you might say, okay, yeah, I know, Mr. Leo, I've actually been paying attention. <laughs> I know that the genetic code is redundant. So we could have CUU, CUC, CUA, and CUG, and all of those code for leucine. So we could have a different code. We could have a different DNA code, but we could still get the same protein. True, you're right. But does that actually, or we could still get the same amino acid, excuse me, forgive me. Um, does that actually play out? Well, not, we have our same, not really, we have our same protein, our cytochrome C, and we're looking at the number, not, or the, the, not the differences in DNA, but now we're looking at the differences of amino acids, right? And so now we see chimpanzee, right? Zero differences from humans. We have monkey, one different, one amino acid difference from humans. Yeast, Sarcomyces cerevisiae, 42 amino acid differences from humans. Now, the protein still does its same job. Right. But again, this speaks not to a design process. But this evidence speaks to a more random process that just happens to work. Right. Somehow uh, pig liver will actually clean uh, human blood. Sheep and cow insulin can be injected into humans and and insulin from uh, the pancreases of sheep and cow can actually actually be used. That's what they did before they got biotechnology and before they uh, inserted the gene, before they used bacteria to make insulin, right? So again, why would a creator make different nucleotide for the same protein? Uh, more closely related species should be similar nucleotide amino acid sequence as well as organ function. That's what we see, right? More closely uh, related organisms that look, look more closely, they have similar DNA, right? A penguin is a bird, a goose is a bird. They have more similar DNA uh, than a bird, than a bat and a goose, uh, or than a bass and a penguin, right? Uh, so that, again, that supports, that supports the tree of life. Now, our counterpoint, right? Is it possible that the exact same protein in different organisms needs to have different sequences to function properly? Could we test this, right? Could we take DNA from yeast and put it into a rhesus monkey uh, embryo and see if it actually functioned? Well, we could. I don't think scientists are really going to bother with that because to them, it's a, it's a bygone conclusion that, no, it's just left over from evolution, right? But if you grow up and if you are in the, the researching, the scientific realm, if you become a professor at a university and you have the tools and the funds, you could you could actually test this. I think it would be I think it would be fascinating. Fascinating. So here's our summary slide, right? So geologic, we talked about fossils, we talked about radio radioactive isotope dating, which is valid. We talked about plate tectonics, canyon carving. We had our summary and then we had our counterpoint, right? Then we went into anatomy and physiology, nervous system, heart, simple to complex, homologous structures, arm bones, spine flexing, similar bones equals common ancestor. Right, counterpoint, who are we to question God? Right, vestigial structures, right, wings that are degenerate and don't help them fly, whale hip bones, tailbone, appendix. Why would a creator make useless structures? It doesn't matter, it speaks to more of a random process. Right, counterpoint, are we sure that they're actually all useless? Uh, and then molecular evidence, right, same protein has different DNA that makes it. Uh, there's actually differences in the amino acid sequence because difference in DNA doesn't necessarily mean difference in amino acid sequence. Right, biochemical similarities, pigs and humans are closely related, so pig livers work just fine. Uh, humans and sheep and cows are closely related, 
So cow, sheep, cow, pig, insulin uh, works just fine, right? Uh, they say common uh, ancestor. We would say common designer, but again, they don't. They don't acknowledge the designer. So big question: Where does this leave us? Okay, this is uh, this is worldview. This is epistemology, right? So so science empiricism is one epistemology, is one way of knowing, right? Uh, the authority. Right? Uh, we would say the authority of the Bible, the authority of God, is another way of knowing something, right? Epistemology is how do you know what is true, okay? You could just look to science and you could say we're a random assemblage of chemicals and life has no meaning uh, and morality is determined by what's good for the whole entire group, right? Uh, or you can look and say, no, we're made in the image and likeness of God uh, and we have dignity and value and, and worth because of that. And our purpose for being here on this earth is to bring honor and glory to God, right? Uh, so kind of where I end up is I know that there are two different ways of knowing. Science excludes the supernatural. Authority of the Bible includes the supernatural. So I know that they're not always going to agree. So I, sorry, let me go back. So they will not always agree. And I'm good with that. I'm okay with that tension, right? If there's a science question, like, should I take this vaccine? I, I look at the science, right? I pray about it. I ask God, I see if there's any biblical principles, but when it, when it comes down to it, I'm like, okay, God has blessed us with medical advances and I'm going to try to use that to stay healthy. Right now, if it's a question of morality, so science, you may remember all the way back from chapter one, science just looks at, can we do this? Science doesn't answer moral questions like, should we do this? We need a higher source to answer the question, should we do this? So if you have a question, look at what type of question it is. If it's a scientific question, yeah, go to science. If it's if it's a if it's a meaning question, if it's an origin question, don't go to science, right? Because they don't acknowledge the supernatural. Go to the Bible because that acknowledges uh, the supernatural. So let me really quickly just shift gears here. Come on, stop recording. All right. So forgive me. Uh, so last thing I want to talk about, I couldn't leave this topic without talking about intelligent design because I know some of you are like, but where's intelligent design? We're a Christian school. We're actually allowed to teach this. We're not like the public school where they say they can't teach it. Okay. So here's intelligent design. The whole idea is that life is so complex that it had to be designed. Right. And so a couple of our arguments would be, well, the chicken and the egg. Right, which came first, DNA or protein? So we know that it takes DNA to make proteins with the, with the central dogma of biology, but then we also know that it takes proteins, DNA polymerase, to make DNA. Right? So which came first, the chicken or the egg? You can't have two things that evolved at once. Now, science has an answer for that, and they, they would answer that question, which came first? They would say RNA came first, because RNA can be turned into DNA. Thank you, retroviruses and uh, reverse transcriptase. Uh, and RNA can be turned into proteins because that's what normally happens, DNA to RNA to proteins. So, so scientists would say you don't have to have DNA and proteins evolving together. Uh, you, have, you have RNA, right? Uh, second point of intelligent design is that the probability of life arising by random chance is so small, it can be considered impossible. So if we were in class, I would go through all these numbers and I would, I would say what they mean. And basically, this is a summary uh, of uh, signature in the cell. By, oh, I forget, I forget the guy's name, but he's the discovery. Oh, Dr. Stephen Meyer, Discovery Institute over in Seattle. Uh, and so, so basically, uh, it's, there's, a, there's a 1 in uh, 10 to the 140th chance that, that we could produce even one protein just by random assemblage. Not, we're not even talking about a cell, right? A cell takes about 450 proteins. Just one cell takes 450 proteins to actually function. So to make one protein, chance so small, and then, and then life, right? And so scientists, they, like, that would be our argument, okay? Scientists actually have an answer for that. They're like, well, if you give it enough time, then it's bound to happen sometime. And we don't know all of the conditions back in prehistoric Earth. And so we can't definitively say what the probability of that thing is. So as, as good as we think our arguments are, right, they're, they're not really that good in, in, the, in the science terms, right? Uh, and then irreducible complexity okay, is, is kind of the third argument for intelligent design. So some molecular machines need over 40 different proteins to work. Classic example is the bacterial flagellum, right? If one is missing, it doesn't work. So all of a sudden, you can't have just one protein evolving and doing its job by itself. Now you need 40 different proteins to evolve all at the same time and to work together in harmony with one another. And if just one of them doesn't work, then the whole entire thing just doesn't work, 
right? And that and that doesn't that doesn't make sense. Again, evolutionary scientists would come back and say, well, we don't exactly know. Like some of these could be used for other uh, other molecular machines, and they are, right? Some of the proteins in the bacterial flagellum are used in in other machines, and and some of them uh, might have had functions before. Uh, that we don't know about and were actually useful. And now through the process of natural selection, they've changed uh, different different things like that. So <laughs> this is the end. Suffice it to say uh, that Christianity, praise the Lord, is not based on our intellect, right? It's not based on, on our thought. It's not based on our empiricism. Uh, it's based on the word of God, right? And we know that the word of God is true because the Holy Spirit is living inside of us, and he tells us that it is true, okay? So you are not going to argue anyone into becoming a Christian, okay? And that's, that, is a, that is a glorious, that is a blessed thing, because guess what? That takes the burden off of us if we're witnessing to people and like, oh, I didn't have the right arguments or I didn't say the right words. No, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will give us the words and the Holy Spirit goes before us and changes people's hearts. So as you progress in your educational career, don't be troubled that science doesn't support your specific worldview. That's totally fine. Science is not the end all be all. I know I'm a science teacher and I'm saying that science is not the end all be all. The Bible and your personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the end all be all. And if you take one thing away from this class, I pray that it's that, that science is not God, but God is God. And we can keep God in his place and we can keep science in its place and glory be to God.